one. You are going to hear a conversation. Before you listen, please look at questions one to six. Good afternoon, Westin Car Club. Could I help you? Oh, afternoon. I was wondering if you could give me some information about your services. Sure. What would you like to know? What about racing training? I heard you had a team. No, not really. We do have a racing track, but haven't formed a team. Perhaps you're thinking about Waverton Car Club. Oh, right. I know it. I've watched an auto rally there. Really? Yes. They've already got a professional team. But we also have our peculiarity. Our track is designed for the starter or fans on senior level instead of the professional ones. Thus, it is very popular with members. Sounds good. We have driving training classes too. All the coaches here are very experienced. Is there any special place for relax? Of course. At the moment, we've got a lounge bar right behind the training centre. Besides, there are vending machines. Everywhere, as well as a fully licensed restaurant by the end of the year. I see. Do you have car renting service? I may need a car these days. Yes, we have a large number of cars in supply. You can choose whatever you want here. Would you please introduce the renting facilities in detail? Sure. We now have two styles of car for rent: Grade C and Grade D. What is the difference? Grade C includes air conditioning, a whole set of stereo. High-class engine. What's more, with low mileage. Spectacular. Is it very expensive? Well, you pay three hundred pounds as a deposit. Then it's forty pounds per day. Oh no, I'm sorry. It's just gone up by fifteen pounds. Sorry about that. It's now fifty-five pounds for the rent each day. I got it. And what's the next type? Well, Grade D doesn't have air conditioners and is a little bit older than Grade C. But the rent would be far less. So, how much exactly is the deposit the same as for Grade C? Actually, it's slightly less than the three hundred pounds. It's two hundred and fifty pounds. But the rent for each day is only thirty-five pounds. Is it a good price for you? Well, it's still far from what I expected. I will pay a visit to nearby cities for at least one week. Thirty-five pounds per day is still beyond my limit. Don't you have any discount? Um. Then maybe you can try the VIP card. Would you please introduce it to me? Of course. You just need to pay a thirty-pound fee for a VIP card. Then you can enjoy an eighty percent discount for Grade C, and seventy-five percent for Grade D. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have thirty seconds to read questions seven to ten. Besides, we also offer road map, sun sheet, and flashlight to the VIP. Oh, that should be all right. By the way, can I pay for it by credit card? Sure, you can pay by cash or credit card, but no checks are permitted. Okay, then I would come in my spare time. What should I do if I want to join? Well, we book you in for an assessment with an instructor who will show you how to use all the equipment. If you want to organise a trial session and look around the centre. You'll need to speak to Anna Manuja. Hmm. Could you spell that, please? Yes, Anna M A N U J A. I'll give you her direct line number. It's five o four double eight nine six one five. Thanks. Thank you for calling Westin Car Club. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part two. Part two. And you are going to hear a lecture. Before you listen, please look at questions 11 to 20. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 11 to 20. Welcome to Hawaii Tour Agency. Let me tell you something about a special package we have going on this week. I know everyone wants to get away from the stress of work and life, so I think you should all consider a week-long vacation to the paradise of Hawaii. First of all, let me tell you all a little about Hawaii. The Hawaiian Islands are of volcanic origin and are edged with coral reefs. Because of its volcanic origins, people often go especially to see the volcanoes. Hawaii is the largest and geologically the youngest island of the group. Oahu is the most populous and economically important. The capital of Honolulu is located on the island of Oahu, the only U.S. state in the tropics. Hawaii is sometimes called the paradise of the Pacific because of its spectacular beauty, abundant sunshine, expanses of lush green plants and beautiful coloured flowers, palm trees, coral beaches with rolling white surf and cloud-covered volcanic peaks rising to majestic heights. Some of the world's largest active and inactive volcanoes are found on Hawaii and Maui. Eruptions of the active volcanoes have provided spectacular displays, but their lava flows have occasionally caused great property damage. The lava can spill down the mountains into the settlements where people live. The most famous of these is right by Honolulu. It is called Diamond Head because, from far away, the top of the volcano looks like a diamond. Vegetation is generally luxuriant throughout the islands, with giant fern forests and lush vegetation. Although many species of birds and domestic animals have been introduced on the islands, there are few wild animals other than boars and goats, and there are no snakes. The coastal waters abound with fish. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have 30 seconds to read questions. More ethnic and cultural groups are represented in Hawaii than in any other state. Chinese labourers who came to work in the sugar industry were the first of the large groups of immigrants to arrive, starting in 1852, and Filipinos and Koreans were the last after 1900. Other immigrant groups, including Portuguese, Germans, Japanese and Puerto Ricans, came in the latter part of the 19th century. Intermarriage with other races has brought a further decrease in the number of pure-blooded Hawaiians who comprise a very small percentage of the population. Now, this all sounds very interesting, right? For only $600 per person, we are offering a tour package to Hawaii. This includes your round-trip airfare and fully guided tours. The duration of the trip is five days, including hotel for five nights and tour buses that will take you all around. We will go to the famous beaches, the volcanoes and the forests. Sign up today to save your space as seats are running out quickly. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation. Before you listen, please look at questions 21 to 30. Now listen to the conversation 
and answer questions 21 to 30. The start of a new academic year is a challenge for booksellers. Anderson Gurley talks to one of the major bookstore managers. Sophia Winnie, you're the manager of Dubai Books and you sell an awful lot of books to students, don't you? Yes, we do. How do you manage to make sure that you're going to have the books students need when all the new courses begin? Basically, we make preparations long before they arrive. Like all other major book retailers, we have a database of information and using that we contact course conveners in May and ask them to send us their book lists. How many books are we talking about? For one course? Yes, as an example. An average course requires about 30 books. We ask lecturers to indicate whether a book is what we call essential reading, you know, the students simply have to get it, or whether it's what they would term recommended reading, or whether it's just a supplementary text that they tend to refer to as background reading. What about predicted buyers? It's not a perfect system, unfortunately. If a lecturer tells us that he expects us to sell 100 copies of a book, we know that we could actually sell anything from 50 to 150. That's why in practice, when it comes to ordering, it's a lot safer to go by the previous year's sales figures, if that's possible, of course, if we've sold the books before. We also build other factors into the equation, including the type of course that the books are for, the student's year group, and a measure of our own judgement. And these criteria make a fairly accurate guide? As accurate as we can be, yes. What about the publishers? Do they take an active role in promoting new books? Certainly. The academic and professional publishing market is worth about £700 million a year, so publishers go to some lengths to make sure that their books are known. The standard procedure they use is to mail out catalogues to lectures or colleges and universities. That's been the main form of promotion for years. Now, of course... They can also post details of new or revised works on websites. Some even go as far as writing individual letters to the appropriate lecturers in order to let them know what's coming up. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have 30 seconds to read questions. The lecturers then contact you if you're interested? That's right. The publishers send us, the booksellers, inspection copies. Lecturers can then get a free copy and decide whether it's going to be suitable for their course. And how does it work with the students? What are they looking for and who helps them most? I think lecturers are best placed to understand the students' needs. Often the critical issue is what represents value for money for students. This is more important than price per se. Do students actually need any books before they start the course? Apparently, a large proportion of students wait to see what they need. Students have a firm idea of what constitutes a good book, so they tend to give themselves time to look at all the options before making a choice. They tend to go for books that are clear and easy to use. Often the texts that their lecturers recommend turn out to be too academic and remain here on our shelves. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Questions 31 to 40 are based on the lecture. Before you listen, please look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. Welcome to the Department of Psychology's Information Day for new and intending students. I'm the head of department and today we plan to give you a clear idea of the courses we offer, their entry requirements, duration and the types of jobs you might obtain after gaining these qualifications. During the course of the day, I hope you will take the opportunity to talk to staff and attend information sessions for particular courses that may interest you. Some of these courses are open to school leavers, but some have particular entry requirements, so it is important to note these. Firstly, the Certificate in Psychology is offered as a six-month course for those wanting a general introduction to the subject for personal or work-related purposes. There are no specific entry requirements. At undergraduate diploma level, we provide a one-year diploma in psychology course designed for those already in employment whose work and previous training is not in psychology. There are no particular entry requirements and the students in this course usually take it to help them progress in their careers. For a major in psychology, we offer a three-year degree course called a Bachelor of Arts, after which students can go on to take other courses if they want to specialise in psychology. The only requirement for this course is the usual undergraduate admission to university. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have 30 seconds to read questions. Now, for the more specialised course in psychology, we offer a master's degree to be taken over 18 months. This can be by research or coursework, but entry to this programme is only through first gaining a degree in psychology. That means you must have a degree majoring in psychology. And last, for those wanting clinical qualifications at postgraduate level, we offer a diploma in clinical psychology over a 12-month period, usually called Clinical Psychology Diploma, for short. The minimum entry requirement for this programme is an appropriate honours degree. Now, it's also important that you have some understanding of the types of work these courses can prepare you for. And it's useful to know the relationship between the work you might do after you complete your course and the work of others who have studied different courses in psychology. As I said before, the certificate in psychology is for personal interest or possibly for work-related purposes, but doesn't qualify you in any particular way. Our students in this course can range from women who have stopped work to care for their children and the children who have now commenced school to support staff in specialised publishing company. They really vary a lot. The undergraduate diploma usually attracts people working in offices, such as banks or in some government departments. If you gain a degree with a major in psychology, again, you are not professionally trained, but this could enable you to undertake further training to obtain professional qualifications. Or it might just be part of a first degree that will help you get a good job that doesn't require particular specialisation at that stage. After completing a master's degree, you would expect to have some specialisation, perhaps in research or on a particular aspect of psychology, such as child development. For those who have a clinical diploma, there are a wide range of jobs available. Some focus on helping people with personal adjustment or family problems. Others might concentrate more on using psychological tests or perhaps working in particular institutions, such as those for the mentally ill or in prisons. There are many other job opportunities, so if you are interested to discuss possibilities with any of the staff today, that is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.